Father, we thank you, Lord, again, uh, as you continue to, to, to be with us, Lord. We ask now that you would just give us uh, ears to hear your spirit, Lord, what you have to say to your word. We ask that you would clear our minds, Lord, from this day. Uh, some of us have some really busy days, uh, our day-to-day, -day, and we just have a lot on our mind. And, Lord, we just need to, we just need to clean our mind because we want to hear from you. Something, something from your word that we can take uh, practically and apply it to our lives uh, when we leave and that we can discuss in the group time after the study. So, Lord, we pray. We ask you because this can only be done by your spirit. It can't be done by nothing else that you would speak to us in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> so, uh, we're still obviously going through First Samuel. Uh, we've been seeing... Saul and David, um, and you know it's been, been kind of interesting because Samuel's been out of the, the picture for a little last few weeks or whatever, uh, and uh, we've been watching David come onto the scene as God's chosen, uh, anointed uh, king of Israel. Uh, but it's kind of cool because we've been able to see just the the process that David has been going through, and the, and the things that have been happening in his life. To get him to a, the place that God has called him to. A long journey he's been on. A long journey already. And we've only got to see David for a few chapters, right? And we've already watched him go through so much and see so many things happen with his life. Uh, just from the time that he was anointed till even this time. And, it's, and it started off what seemed to be as a good thing for David. And now we've watched Saul and just the... the so the enemy come and work against his anointing. And that's, you know, that's what we, that's our lives today, really. Uh, while God anoints you and he places his hand upon you and gives you a calling in your life, the enemy comes against, and that's what the Christians, that's what we as Christians get that, that mindset of, oh, you know, uh, when you're called or when God has a calling in your life and gets to move in your life, then the warfare on this end begins to pick up. And that's, this is the type of, of, Accounts of the scripture that we use and uh, and talk about when we mention something like that, because the enemy comes attack, comes against the work, and and if any of you in here have been on sort of that that walk, that path, that new path for some some of us in here, and the old path for for some of us, you have experienced the opposition, and so we've been watching David experience this opposition right from the get-go, right from the beginning of his anointing. And, uh, but God is showing us as readers and shows David, and tonight's chapter really is a good picture of God showing us and showing David uh, his intervention, his providence, and his work that he comes on to the person or people that he anoints, and how God's purpose, uh, though Brought, though met with opposition, is saw through to the end. Is is the doors are open continue. This is an encouraging thing for us today, as we feel that God is is putting a uh, giving us a vision for our lives, and 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 the, the road gets hard, man. And that's what we see here in David. The road gets hard. That's why you read the Psalms, and he has so many of these explanations about. You know, though I walk in the shadow of death, or oh my enemy, it seems like they're always, uh, you know, they're they're achieving or they're successful. And David has so many writings about this type of situation because he went through it right from the beginning. And when you read the Psalms, you can relate with David because you say, I know exactly what he's doing right now, from the get go, having the oppression from the enemy. And but see, I don't like to camp on that so much because the Bible doesn't. The whole Bible in itself is not a message of opposition. Even though it's mentioned so much in the scripture, the Bible is a message of deliverance. The Bible in a whole is a message about being set free. It's a message about God wanting the Christian and God wanting his anointed people uh, to be delivered and to be able and equipped to be free to serve him. So often in our time today, and you hear a lot, you get this feeling of, oh, Christianity's got to just be tough. It's just, oh, man, one brick after the next, you know what I'm saying? One turn, one turn, it's like a never-ending battle. But the reality is, is that we are set free, and that we are delivered, 
and that our oppressor is already limited. Our oppressor is already brought down. And that's the message of the scripture, and that's the message we're going to see uh, even tonight. And, and one main point to focus on is, because I'm just going to kind of read the account, because sometimes you just got to read it, you know. And uh, it, the, the point we want to see is that it's not always, we don't always want to know, uh, you know, has God deserted me in my trial? Uh, I feel like, how, how can I know that God is, 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 is my trial going to be over? You know, when can I finally look back and say, this is finally done? Um, but sometimes the, the point we miss is really examining God, you know what, am I still standing in my trial? And sometimes the evidence of you still standing is, is, our, is enough for us to believe that God has met you and has given you the power to be who you are as he's called you to be. Sometimes us just being able to, to be sane in some of our trials is evidence enough that God's power is within you. Oh, but we so often expect that. No, no, no. I want God's power because I want this trial to be over. I want this situation to be gone. You know what I'm saying? I want to be the victorious Christian. I want to, I want to look back. But hey, you know what? Have we ever stopped to think that maybe just the fact that I can still breathe is evidence enough that I have God's power in me? Just the fact that I can still come to church, open my Bible and read it and pray at home and, and, and fellowship. Sometimes... That's enough evidence to know that God's power is, is in you because for the most part, if some of you remember back who you used to be, without the Spirit of God, you wouldn't be sitting here right now. You wouldn't have made the choice on a Thursday night if you're going through a trial or situation to come and listen to a Bible study. That's the power of God working in you already. Just to even get you to come and say, I'd rather hear a Bible study tonight than be at home and wallow in my sorrow or, or, or deal with my pain or or resolve my situation. Sometimes just the, the evidence is us still being able to go forward. So be encouraged in that. Be encouraged in the fact that, you know, just that we're able to still go forward is evidence that God is supplying you with what you need to continue to go, go, go forward, to go, to press on. We look lightly to those things sometimes. We don't pay too much attention to that. So let's look at chapter 19, verse 1. He says, and Saul spake to Jonathan, his son, and to all his servants, that they should kill David. So here's this secret meeting for only the top dogs to know. Uh, and Saul is finally disclosing his plan. Uh, he's letting everybody know, my intention now is no longer a secret. I want to kill that boy. I want David dead. See, it's that relentless, that, that ongoing attack that is against David because he is the anointed king of Israel, because he is the chosen, because God placed his hand upon him to, to, to work through him in delivering Israel. And so now the enemy, in this case, this picture Saul, is nonstop, relentlessly going to war, again, going in his mind to attack David. And it says, but Jonathan, you guys remember Jonathan, right? The one we talked about last couple weeks ago. The, the brother, basically, the, the spiritual brother for David. Uh, he says, Saul's son delighted much in David. And Jonathan uh, told David, saying, Saul, my father seeketh to kill thee. Now therefore I pray thee, take heed to thyself unto the morning. And abide in a secret place and hide Thyself. See, guys, we don't go without excuse when we're placed into a situation where we know the enemy is working against you, where we know that the enemy has mischief or he has purpose to deceive you. The Spirit of God doesn't leave us without excuse to hear him, to know that we need to go in another direction. See, so often do we feel like, oh man, God set me up this time. Or you know what, I, I didn't see this one coming. You know, I could have known that. You know, oh man, the enemy caught me off guard this time. See guys, but we have to realize something about the Spirit of God. The Bible tells us that the Holy Spirit will remind us of things that bring to our remembrance of things which were spoken by Him. See, the Holy Spirit has an objective to do in the Christian's life today. The Holy Spirit's objective is to, to speak to the Christian, to let him or her know 
that, you know what, this is what God is asking of you to do. How many of us have so many justifications before God on why you end up doing what you did? And a lot of the times you, you take that justification and you say, okay, you know, I know I didn't have a right to sin. I didn't have a right to stumble. And yeah, I knew I thought I was thinking about a verse or I thought I felt something, an, impre an impression by the Spirit. But you know, I wasn't sure if it was God and I went ahead and did it anyway. See, He doesn't want to, see, God is loving enough to us, cares enough about us to say to us, listen, you're going in the wrong direction. How many times do you say, oh, I want to hear from God, man. I want God to speak to me about my life. Oh, my goodness. I, I became a Christian. I'm set free, and I'm doing this, and I'm doing that. Now, I just want God to guide me. I want him to speak to me. Well, guess what? He wants to speak to you, too, and he wants to guide you. But the enemy is the one trying to convince you that God has no business of what you're doing. The enemy is the one that tries to deceive us into thinking that God is looking this direction while well, you're standing over here. This is not true. The Holy Spirit is with you. Jesus is with us every step of the way. His desire is to never take his hand off you and abandon you, especially if he is the one calling you to the direction that you're going. See, Jonathan here is a type of warning. He's a type of the Holy Spirit for David. He's saying, look, I'm going to tell you something, David, that you don't know. I'm going to tell you something, David, that I got wind of on this side of the kingdom over here. My dad, he wants to kill you, man. And honestly, you need a book. You need to go hide. You need to go somewhere because you need to make a move here. See, the Holy Spirit is faithful in this, guys. You know which direction not to go. And you know which direction to go. You, you know when the Lord is putting on your heart, knock that off. Or go this way. Or stay away from that. Don't go back to that house. Don't go back down that street again. You know, don't, don't, don't take a left or don't take a right. Because it's going to be bad for you if you go that direction. See, I was recently having a discussion with someone, and this is personal in my own life, uh, when I at one point was struggling with something uh, big time in my spiritual walk as a Christian. One, one of the biggest things I learned when I was crawling out of that time in my life was God allowed me to set red flags all over my life. And say, okay, you know now when to go to bed. <laughs> you know to go to sleep when your wife goes to sleep, okay, Phil? <laughs> because if you stay up after her, you're going to get in trouble. You know, you, you know which phone not to buy this time, Phil. Okay? Uh, because your phone gets you in trouble. <laughs> okay, see, I, I put, not that I overcame or mastered my, oh, this part of me that is a man. Oh, I mastered this temptation. No, I can fall right now. But God allowed me to learn how to place red flags in my life, warning flags, to say, don't go that way. Don't go this way, because those ways have failed you. See, the Holy Spirit was speaking to me, as the Holy Spirit speaks to every single one of us, trying to tell you which way to go. No matter how young or old you are, he's still helping you to learn and identify how to be a strong and successful Christian. And what I mean by success is one who doesn't always fall and stumble and always coming back to church the next day saying, oh, goodness, I need to be forgiven again. Where's the new Bible back? You know, yeah, I got seven of them in my car, but I need another one because I need to get saved again because I messed up again. See, it's, it's, the, it's the Holy Spirit that says, no, see, listen, you don't have to keep hitting that wall back and forth like one of them things with batteries and until the battery dies and all it does is bump against the wall, a little robot bump against the wall. You don't have to be that robot. See, it's not, the Christian wasn't intended to be that. It was intended that we walk in victory. So we have to have an ear to hear what the Spirit is saying to us. And that's why the prayer is always, Lord, let us hear what your Spirit is saying. Jesus said it. That was what he said to the seven churches in Revelation. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. That's our prayer today. Father, give us an ear to hear what your Spirit is saying. Because his spirit is out to protect. It's out to guide us. It's out to lead us in the right path. That's what God's intention is. If our perspective, not philosophy, but mindset, can be that God is actually sitting up there on his throne wanting good for your life, can you imagine the perspective you would have every day? If you woke up knowing that God's desire for you today is to be successful in your walk with him, is to have victory over temptation. Imagine if this was our mindset every morning. Today, I'm going to wake up the mindset that God wants me to be victorious for him today. That's what he wants, not just what I want. 
I want to go to see a movie tonight, you know. I want to go and hang out and do this or do that. That's what I want to do. God wants me to be victorious for him today. And so looking at Jonathan now telling David, take heed to thyself unto the morning. And abide in a secret place and hide thyself, David. Trouble's ahead, man. My dad's got it out for you. And I will go out and stand beside my father, verse 3, in the field <coughs> where thou art. And I will commune with my father of thee, and what I see, that I will tell thee. And Jonathan spake good unto David, Saul's father. And he said unto him, Let not the king sin against his servant and against David, because he's not sinned against you, and because his works have been to thee were very good. Yeah, come on. No, David's been good to you. Don't. Don't try to don't, don't try to kill him. What's going on here? Verse 5. For he did put his life in his hand and slew the Philistine. Don't you remember? And the Lord brought a great salvation for all Israel. Take note of that. The Lord brought a great salvation. Okay, highlight that in your Bible. That is the theme of this chapter. That is the theme of, of uh, God is the one who brings out great salvation. The Bible tells us that salvation comes from God. And God alone. So he's saying, and, and just to take a moment of reflection, we remember David wasn't the victor. It was God that was victorious through David. It was the testimony that David had of God always protecting him out when he was fighting bears and lions and protecting his flock. God, remember, we have to remember back to that story. David rested not in his power, not in his strength, but in his Experience and testimony with God. It's the same for every other person that God used in a mighty way in the Bible. Don't you always read those stories and go, man, I want to be like those guys in, in Hebrews chapter 11, the faith chapter. These guys who are said to have killed lions and, you know, and, and killed giants and all this stuff. I, I want to be that type of Christian. I want to be known. See, but they were known for that because it was their faith in God. And to believe that God would be the one that would instit institute this victory upon them. It's the same message to the whole scripture. God is the one who is victorious in our life. So, he said, remember that, uh, Dad, about David and all this. Uh, <clears throat> so, he says, thou sawest it and did rejoice, whereof then wilt thou sin against innocent blood and to slay David without a cause? Verse 6. So, Saul hearkened unto the voice of Jonathan, and Saul swear, as the Lord liveth, as Saul always does, that uh, he shall not be slain. So, here's Saul on his... His emotional thing again, you know, okay, Jonathan, I get you, man. I won't kill David. And I, that's it. And so Jonathan called David, and Jonathan showed him all those things, and Jonathan brought David to Saul, and he in his presence as in times past. And there was war again, and David went out and fought with the Philistines and slew them with a great slaughter, and they fled from him. See, it's always when there's war again. See, it's always when it's time to get moving forward. It's always when it's getting time to start doing work for the Lord. It's always when God is beginning to call you out. Then we see what happens right after that. So look at verse 9. Here we go. And the evil spirit from the Lord was upon Saul. And he sat in his house with his javelin in his hand. And David played with his hand, playing with the thing, the harp. And Saul... Whatever, what he just said a minute ago, that I'll never slay him again. There he is now sitting with his javelin. Hmm, look at my javelin. Oh, that'll look good, real good on David. And, and he says, but he slipped, uh, it says, and Saul sought to smite David even to the wall with the javelin. But he slipped away out of Saul's presence. And he smote the javelin into the wall. And David fled and escaped that night. And Saul also sent messengers unto David's house to watch him and to slay him in the morning. And, okay, I'm not going to call her Michael anymore. Uh, I'm going to call her Mikael. Because I asked Hector, I go, all right, man. I go, I'm calling, I'm calling this girl Michael, dude. He goes, what do you call her Michael for? What, what kind of, what would you say that? I said, well, what do you want to call her? He's calling her Mikael. I said, okay, I'll call her Mikael. So David's wife, Mikael, okay, told him, saying, if thou save not thy life tonight, tomorrow thou shalt be slain. So notice again, here's David. He was, he, was, he was set, delivered by Jonathan at first, okay, uh, speaking to him and warning him. Now he, he goes back into the kingdom, everything's fine. Uh, he goes out to war, and now here's Saul once again, 
with this mindset of wanting to kill him. He has the javelin. He tries to, he tries to spear him. David escapes once again. And now David is being warned of another attack. And that's coming from now his wife. Interesting. See, now, but his wife is a little bit, this, this situation is a little bit different than with Jonathan. Look at now verse 12. So Michal let David down through the window, and he went and fled and escaped. And so David's out of the picture, but Michal took an image and laid it in the bed and put a pillow of goat's hair for his bolster and covered it with a cloth. And when Saul sent messengers to take David, she said, he is sick. Okay, so she's, she's basically telling the story here. And, uh, and Saul sent the messengers again to see David, saying, Bring him up to me in the bed, that I may slay him. Saul's like, I don't care if he's sick. I didn't, if he's sick, then kill him right in his bed. Okay? <laughs> and when the messengers were come in, behold, there was an image in the bed with a pillow of goat's hair for his bolster. Look at verse 17. And Saul said to me, Why have you deceived me so? And sent away my enemy that he has escaped. See, this is interesting that I, I'm not in no way going to justify this deception that she's doing here to her dad. <coughs> but you know, at the most, I can say this, way, this much. God's ways are not our ways. And I can say this much too. And I'm, again, not supporting the fact of somebody being mischievous or whatever. Uh, but the fact is, is God used this situation here to keep Saul away from David. But you know what? See, this didn't really work last time, did it? See, because even though Jonathan was able to deliver him once, and yet the, this thing resurfaced again, and so here we go with the same thing, him being saved, and, and Saul's now confronting me down. Look what he says. Uh, verse, uh, where was I? 17. Saul said, okay, so why have you deceived me so and sent away my enemy? Then he escaped, and Michal answered Saul, oh, he said to me, let me go. Uh, why should I kill him? She's saying, David was crazy. Why? I had to let him go. Okay, he was trying to threaten my life. So now this is the second deliverance here. Kind of third, but the second that we see two people intervening for David. Jonathan and now his wife. But you know what? And now we're going to get, as, I, as we get towards the end here of this chapter, we're going to really see the point here. See, God will often use things in our lives, and the Holy Spirit will speak to us continually to direct us into the place in our walk where we need to be. Okay? He will continue to do that. And for David, he's using people. He's using Jonathan. He's using his wife. But we all know one thing true here about this story. The thing about this story is we know that God, it doesn't say that, oh, he used. He, uh, that Jonathan was brought salvation, or that Michal brought salvation. The Bible says God is the one who brings salvation. See, God will continue in our lives to, to save us by using circumstances and situations around us. He can use somebody in your life. He can use someone to speak to you in your life. He can use uh, your wife. He'll use your brothers that you're in fellowship with. He'll use a pastor. He'll use a Bible study to speak to you and to help you go into a direction that you know you should be going into. But ultimately, it isn't that person who is going to save you. It isn't that person who is going to always be the one to give you counsel and direction on what you should be doing. A lot of people rest in pastors. All right, well, okay, they're a pastor. <laughs> a lot of people rest in, in their wife. Oh, I always got to go to my wife before I do anything. Or a lot of people rest in whatever it might be, you rest. But see, God didn't make, make this whole thing for them. He didn't make you and your walk to always depend on somebody else. Because as we're seeing here, the intervention when it came to people for David was only temporary. It was only temporary. Jonathan didn't have the final solution, nor did David's wife have the final solution. Look at this, is verse 18. So David fled and escaped and he came to Samuel, to Ramah. Oh, well, maybe Samuel then. Maybe it's in Samuel who's going to be his ultimate protection. Maybe if he goes to the prophet, good old Samuel. Maybe if he goes there, that's where he's going to find his great protection. You know, not that pastor and not that one, but that one. If I could only get to Pastor Jeff, he will be the one to give me the answer. Well, not Jeff. Maybe if I, back then, you know, maybe I go to a higher pastor than Jeff, somebody older than him. Maybe they'll relate to me and understand my ways, you know. Okay, Billy Graham. I'll go talk to Billy Graham then. I'll call him and email him. Billy has the answers. He's been around for a long time. 
and so on and so forth. You end up at the Pope. Maybe the Pope's got the answer. Somebody's got to have the answer. So he goes to Samuel. I'm not saying Samuel like the Pope. But he goes to Samuel, the spiritual leader. Where else would you go? Right? And he told them all that Saul had done to him. Oh, Samuel, you have no idea, man. Like, oh, bro. Huh. Samuel's just looking at him with all this wisdom, probably going, hmm. And, he, and Samuel went and dwelt in Naoth. And it was told Saul, there we go, back, back at it again. Where did that, where did that dude go? <laughs> and it was told Saul, saying, Behold, David is at Naoth in Ramah. And Saul sent messengers down there to take David. But now listen, interesting. We are finally going to see some real intervention here. Okay? We're going to see some God stuff going on here. Not some Mikhail stuff, not some Jonathan stuff. Not some Samuel stuff. I, oh, what do you mean not Samuel? I thought Samuel was going to be the one, the spiritual leader. <laughs> it goes on to say, uh, as he sent his messengers, and when they saw the company of the prophets prophesying, and Samuel standing as appointed over them, the Spirit of God was upon the messengers of Saul, and they also prophesied. See, all of a sudden now, Something else intervenes, and it wasn't Sam. Something else is going to stop this parade of police officers that are attempting to wipe David out. And what we see it to be is the Spirit of God in this point. It was God's Spirit who, who intervened here for the, on behalf of David. It was God's Spirit who said, yeah, I used Jonathan. Yeah, I used your wife, even if she did a little thing in the bed and made it look like you with goat's hair and all this stuff. And it worked for the time being. But it was the Spirit of God now. And we see, look at what happens next. And when it was told Saul, he sent other messengers, and they prophesied likewise. And Saul sent messengers again for the third time. What is going on? Every time I send somebody down there, they end up prophesying. What's going on down there? And Saul sent messengers again the third time, and they prophesied also. You see, when you, as a Christian, and as a brother in the Lord, when it's finally that you're pressed up against the wall and you have nowhere else to go and no one else to run to. And when Jonathan and Mikhail or your wife or pastor or whoever isn't quite getting it to whatever you need to set you free or to help you or protect you. When you're finally, you're at your last, Samuel was, man, where else can David go after Samuel, man? There, there was no one else around. All he knew was Samuel was the prophet. That's when God's spirit intervenes on our behalf. And that's where the Bible says to us that salvation is from God. You see, guys, God is wanting. Sure, He's going to use people in your life. He's going to use those who know you. He's going to use Bible studies. He's going to use situations to, to get you out of another one or direct you. But, you know, ultimately, at the end of the day, what God really wants out of every single one of us in this room is for us to look up to Him, to look up to heaven and say, Lord, I need you in this matter. See, my salvation didn't come from anybody else. My salvation didn't come from no man. My salvation didn't come from, from Greg Glory when you walk down at the Harvest Crusade or, or from Pastor Jeff if you come down here and go to the prayer room or whatever. My salvation came from one place, and that's Jesus. And so why then do we think sometimes when we're up against a situation in our lives where it can even seem life-threatening such as David's, why would we turn and run to anybody else? Why wouldn't we turn to the person who set your soul free? Who set you free from sin? Who saved you from yourself? Then why, in the process of time of our Christian walk, can a situation come to us and we think that Jesus probably can't handle it? And maybe we need something else to help us figure this out. Maybe I need to go see a real counselor. Because pastors aren't real counselors. They can't offer medication. Maybe I need to go see someone where I can go get, you know, on some meds and I can sit around for a while and zone out. Maybe I need to talk about when I was three, you know, think about my dad back then. Maybe I need all these different things. But no, wait a minute. Don't you remember the person who set you free? The one who's, who saved you even while you were yet a sinner? The one who gave you sanity? The one who gave you a purpose to live? And say, I want to love my wife again? I want to raise my kids right. I don't want to raise them all weirded out in this world today. The one who gave you purpose 
to say, gosh, you know, I'm receiving something from this Bible. And whatever it is I'm receiving, I want to give it to my family because I know it's going to save them and work for them. Isn't it that? Isn't, it that, isn't he the one who in times where you feel like you're up against the wall, in times where you feel like there, there, there's nowhere else to run, that's where God says, I'm trying to get your attention. Don't you see? Dave, it's time to learn a lesson that you're never going to forget. You see, David, because you're going to be the king of Israel, David. And in order for you to be the king of Israel, David, I have to have you know something and something sure. And I have to know that you'll never forget this when you go on this new venture in your life. Or you go on this new journey in your life. Or when God sets you on a new path in your life. Or he gives you a new purpose for your family. Or you're getting married. Or all of a sudden something's changing in your life. God wants you to remember one thing and never forget it. That any time... You need to be delivered. It's going to be from him. And no one else. It's going to come from no other direction. But it has to come from him. David had to remember this. See, God was trying to teach him lessons he'd never forget. David, oh man, I got so much plans for you, young David. I got so much for you, man. But you got to remember salvation comes from God. Remember what it was in that power that gave you to defeat a giant. Remember what it was, the power that gave you to save your flock from those, from those lions and those bears. It was the Spirit of God. It was the Spirit of God that gave you that power. Nobody can take that from you. I don't care who they are. I don't care who they think they are. And I don't care who they say they are. But nobody can take from you the power that raised Jesus from the grave that lives in you. See, nobody, Satan can't take that from you. He can't touch it. As much, as many times as he'll send them messengers to try to kill you, he can't touch the Spirit of God in you. He can't mess with it. Oh, man, but I, I got to get money. Uh, money ain't the Spirit. This, uh, money's a lot different, isn't it? <laughs> the Spirit of God ain't going to buy me no car, bro. But the Spirit of God gives you wisdom, gives you purpose, gives you guidance, gives you maturity. It's not in the world. And look at what he says. Verse 22. Then when he, when he went to Ramah and came to a great well that is in Sacred, and he asked and said, Where's Samuel and David? And one said, Behold, they're at Naoth in Ramah. Said <coughs> Saul Katan took on this whole thing of, uh, if, if they can't do it now, you got to do it yourself kind of thing. <laughs> you know, I got to do it myself. This is where the, the battle intensifies, isn't it? Sometimes we feel like Satan is the one messing around in our lives. I just recently talked to a, a, a family, and uh, they, they came with a, um, a girl who was uh, demon-possessed. And all of the family experienced the same thing. And I'm real analytical. I'm not trying to say, uh, you know, I'm, I'm just real logical. That's my mindset. So I'm always rather skeptical, skeptical right away. Mm, man, they don't really on drugs. Dream, you know, she's schizophrenic. What's up here? You know what I'm saying? Because in order to tell me this girl's demon possessed, you bet. Let me see the blood come out of her eyes. You know what I'm saying? And so that's my mindset. Lord, forgive me, but I believe it because it's in the scripture. It talks of demon possession. So they're telling us the story, and and they're and they're all have the same story. And they were saying she she her voice even changed. And, and this is not a little girl. They're older. They're like an older family. And she started saying things that only their dead mother knew and started saying to them. And that was when I'm going, oh, this is getting interesting. You know, and, and yeah, you know, then she started calling us sort of by the names of, of that my mom used to call us when we were kids, and she couldn't have known that. And uh, and then but then she started saying she was Satan and all these types of things, and, and my, my intent was like, hmm, that's kind of weird. But because Satan is not omnipresent and all these things, and I'm starting to weigh all this top of my head. And um, but the fact of the matter is, what I'm trying to say, is this family experienced a major spiritual oppression, whatever it was, okay? That's, I boil it down now. What, I'm not discrediting what they said, but whatever it was, it was a major, major spiritual distraction and spiritual oppression for this family. It brought them all to a place of fear. It brought them all to a place of confusion. Because, but what I noticed in conversation, conversation with them was they all, in some way, they were all different. They were like brother, sister, family, or boyfriend, girlfriend type thing. They all, in some way, had a relationship with God at some point in their lives. 
And so it became evident to me. No matter what is taking place here in the circumstance, the fact is, is God is trying to draw you, you see, close to him. He's trying to draw your reminder of who he was to you. He's using this scenario in their lives to bring them all back to church for kind of God. They're all sitting in their office up here, the whole family, listening to us share with them the word of God. And, and, all, and you need to get back right with the Lord and all this stuff. You see, because it's, it's the enemy begins to start increasing the warfare, increasing the deception. Increasing the attack. Increasing, man. It's like, why does this always have to happen? So Saul himself, the one sending all these messengers, sending all these police guys down there to kill David, is going now himself. Oh, as to say, that's it, man. I'm going to take care of this guy once and for all. As the enemy sometimes tries to get us to believe that he is the same way. But now watch what happens. Verse 23. So there he goes. He went over there to the same place. And sure enough, the Spirit of God was upon him also. And he went on and prophesied until he came in Ramah. So even Saul, when he arrived on the scene, even Satan, even the oppression, when it arrives on our scene, it doesn't mean you. Because if Satan was to meet you, he'd cut you and have to chew you up and spit your head out. See, that's the truth of the spiritual warfare. But the good thing about us, you and I, and this is where we have to be in constant reminder and be sure we're walking this way. When Satan or the oppression meets you, it doesn't meet you. It meets the Lord. It meets the Spirit of God. Colossians 3, chapter 3 says that, uh, you know, I'm going to read it because I have a feeling I'm going to mess that one up. Colossians 3. Where, where is Colossians at? That's Ephesians. I didn't, I didn't mark this one. Where is it at? It's over there. It's in the New Testament, Phil. Uh, okay, here we go. Yeah, yeah, mine's 966. Uh, all right. It says, For ye are dead. Question you gotta start asking yourself right now, are you dead? For ye are dead. Your life now, see it says, is hid with Christ in God. John Corson did the best breakdown of that verse. At that, when the Costa Mesa back then they tried to do a tent, most recent tent revival where you guys, how you guys went to that? They did it in the parking lot and they put the tent up, you know, to kind of revive the old bones of the old days. Uh, but it was good nonetheless. John Corson did a real good study on this verse. And I'll always remember this verse because of his study. Because he really, he did a, a, an hour talk on a snicker bar. And he talked about the snicker bar, that he ate the snicker bar on the way over to the study there at the tent thing. And, and, and he said, and he said to the crowd, but I ate three snicker bars. And he says, but you guys would have never known how many snicker bars I ate because you can't see them in my stomach. He goes, you see, that's the same way. That you appear before anything. See, Jesus just takes picture you as a snicker bar. And Jesus ate you. And when the enemy approaches you, he doesn't see you in the stomach of Jesus. He sees Jesus. And that's why the enemy stands no ground. Because we are hid in Christ. See, we are dead. Our lives are dead. Galatians 2.20 says what? I'll read that one too. Yeah. Galatians 2.20 says... I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I. I don't live anymore, man. Okay? Uh, but Christ lived in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith of the Son of God who loved me and he gave himself for me. You see, guys, we are dead. Okay? The flesh is dead. We, we don't have power anymore. We don't have the protection we need uh, physically in this, in this man, in this flesh from, God, from the enemy. See, we, are, we have been crucified with Christ. The question that I'm asking some, some of you here, are you crucified with Christ or not? Are you hid in Christ Jesus or are you still using your own resources and your own intelligence and your own mindset and your own agenda to present yourself holy? Or to present yourself as a Christian even? Are you learning all the lingo so you can say all the Christian words just so you can present yourself as a Christian? 
Are you just highlighting your Bible and you get all kinds of different ones and just start going through it so you can look like you have a really experienced Bible? See, but are we just taking that outward form of what the world says a Christian looks like? Because if you are, you're going to fail. It's not going to work. Because you need to be dead. In order to save one's life, you have to first lose it. But to lose your life is to save it. So, verse 24, I have no idea why to. And he stripped off his clothes. Also prophesied before Samuel in like manner, who lay down naked all day and all night. This must have just been what the prophets did. Wherefore they say, is Saul also among the prophets? So Saul finds himself also prophesying like all those others that he sent. And David, and hopefully even us, even us tonight would say, it's in the spirit of God that I find my strength. That I'm going to find my place. I'm tired of looking around for people. I'm not going to be a people asker all the time. Seeking to find answers from others. I need to go to the source. I need to go to the one who, is, who I'm living through. I need to go to the one, Jesus, who even keeps me standing in my trial. I need to go to him. Because he's going to have the final answer. He's going to have the deterrence of the enemy. He's going to have what deters the enemy. Jesus proved it in the temptation, but Satan went up against it. Jesus just said, get, get out of here, man. Gave him the word three times. Get on out of here. I don't have, I don't have time for you, Satan. And this is the message he says to us. It's Romans. I'll finish on this verse. Romans uh, chapter 8. Verse... 38 and 39 it says for I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come nor height nor depth nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord you see guys this is this is the power we have are you resting in that are you, are you satisfied? Are you filled with the Lord? Are you hiding inside him? Give up if you're not. Let it down, man. It's not going to work. It's not going to help. Don't rely on the Michaels or the Jonathans. Even though it worked for time, you got to rely on him because he's the one, ultimate one, who's going to give you what you need. And that spirit that lives in you is what's going to conquer these things in our life. Amen? Amen. That's great. <laughs> Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word, and we thank you, Lord, uh, that your Holy Spirit is so real, and that you have purpose to give us the Holy Spirit. You said you had to go. You were telling your disciples you had to go, because you were going to bring the, the comforter. Lord, and that's, that's what we have. We have that spirit, that comforter, to, to, to remind us of things we need to know. Lord, and help us to no longer run to the things that you don't want us to find safety. Because as we see even in scriptures like tonight, the only true safety is in you. The only true protection is in you. No matter what the situation or circumstance is, whether it's our family, whether it's job, whatever trial, whatever situation, even if, like David, a life-threatening one, salvation comes from you. Help us to remember that and help us to walk in that in the power of your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen.